Hello, happy innovators. How are you doing? I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. I know. I promised you in that last podcast that I was going to get busy making you some more Singularity podcasts. And sure enough, what, two weeks go by and there's nothing from me. And I know that you're thinking that I was shirking my Singularity podcast duties, but I'm here to tell you that you're wrong, okay? You're wrong. Because I wasn't shirking my duties. Basically, what happened was, you know, a completely unexpected, unforeseen, unpredictable tragedy happened in my family, okay? And uh, I'm going to explain to you what happened. That's what this podcast is going to be about today, just so you can kind of get an idea of what was going on. And so here it is, okay? About two weeks ago, um, my wife came home from work on a Friday, okay? Friday night, uh, getting ready for the weekend. And let me tell you, okay, it was one of those weeks where it was kind of a rough week. Like my wife was particularly tired and fatigued from work and uh, I was kind of like looking forward to spending some time with her and maybe sleeping a lot, you know, catching up on our sleep and um, having a nice, quiet, pleasant weekend. Okay. Well, not so much because when she came home, uh, we got a phone call from her father. Now, My wife's mother and father live in Las Vegas, Nevada, okay? Um, Which, you know, if you look at a map of the continental United States and you look at Massachusetts and you look at Nevada, you can see that it's pretty much on the other side of the country, okay? So, anyway, um, we get this phone call from her father and he says that he wants to speak to me. Okay, so I get on the phone and he proceeds to tell me that my wife's mother had passed away. Okay, and my wife is an only child because that's something that you should know. So she doesn't have any brothers or sisters or anything. And, um, her mother had passed away in her sleep. Okay. Uh, an elderly woman, you know, um, and it just kind of punched us both like right in the gut. Okay. I mean, it was just like, what? Like what? Because, you know, she wasn't sick. There wasn't anything wrong. There was no lead up to this event. It just happened. And, you know, my wife's mother and father had been married for a long time. They had been married for about 50 or 52 years, I think, to be exact. Um, and we were just kind of in shock, you know, like, what? Like, what? She, she died? Like, what? You know, she's not here anymore. Like, what are you talking about? This doesn't make any sense, you know? Um, So needless to say, okay, that idea of having this, you know, quiet, restful weekend was abruptly, you know, abandoned. And, you know, we hopped on the next flight, okay, to Las Vegas, Nevada. Now... This was a strange experience, I think, more so for my wife, really, obviously, than it was for me, okay? Because she was my mother-in-law, and I loved her, and I cared about her, and I love her daughter, okay? (laughs) You know, this is the most important person in my life. I mean, really, okay? My best friend, you know? 
and she just got the worst news, you know, that she lost her mother. And, you know, honestly, my wife and I both had, over the years, you know, we kind of had thought about it. We've talked about it. Like, you know, you explore the idea that one day, you know, one of your parents might die or one of us might die, you know, like what would happen? What would we do? And, you know, if my, if my mom passed away, what would we do? How would we handle it? You know, what would it be like? And, you know, you just maybe try to imagine it and then you forget about it and you go on with your life, right? And that's kind of like how it went for her and for I, you know, over the duration of our marriage. So we've been married now for about 15 years. We have an anniversary coming up. And uh, I've known her mother for, man, probably about 30 years, okay? Maybe even more than that now, I'm not even sure. But I've known her mother for a very long time and I've known her father for a very long time, obviously. So, um, so it was an interesting experience. Um, it was sad. And it was kind of like, you know, you get on the plane, you're heading there, and you don't really know what to expect. You know, we had traveled there before, but, you know, it was to see both of her parents. So it was really kind of an unknown, like what we were going to find on the other end of this journey, which is a very long journey. Okay, it's about, I think, six hours by airplane from Massachusetts to Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, it was also kind of weird because normally when my wife and I travel to Las Vegas, we go during the summertime where there's no snow on the ground or anything. So there's no real difference between the weather where we're living and the weather where they're living. So this was the first time that we traveled during the winter. So we left like right as like a blizzard was going to set in on the area that we live in. We jumped on a plane, flew to a place that's, you know, a desert, really. It's a, uh, a city built in the desert. <laughs> that's what it is. Okay. So one thing I need to express to you, okay, I need to tell you, because this is a factor in this story, okay? About like three days before we got the phone call from my wife's father, okay, about her mother's passing, I was out in my yard, okay? And everything where we live at that moment was frozen ice. Like everything was ice. It wasn't just cold. It wasn't just winter with snow. Everything was frozen, okay? And I'm walking through my property and I step on a piece of black ice, okay? And I slipped and fell and I landed right on my bum. And let me tell you something, okay? It was like, as soon as I hit the ground, I knew, like, I just got hurt, okay? I knew it, like something, I just did something to my back, okay? Well, let me tell you, for the next like three days after that, okay? leading up to the day where we got this phone call, my ass like hurt so bad. It was like just standing up and sitting down. It was like so painful, <laughs> okay? Like, wow, okay, it hurt. I really hurt myself, okay? Now, I didn't go to the doctor. It wasn't like that kind of thing, okay? But I was in need of like healing, okay? It needed to heal. It was extremely uncomfortable. Anyway, so now you can imagine, okay, uh, you know, we get this phone call with this bad news, and now, like, I realize, okay, I'm gonna have to do this, you know, flying for six hours one way and six hours back. You know, I'm gonna have to endure this extreme pain, <laughs> okay? for this trip, okay? And it's laughable now, but let me tell you, at the time, it was like, you know, impending doom, okay? Um, 
and I'm all healed now, so everything is okay, okay? But, so we get on this flight, you know, we jump on this flight to Las Vegas. So after enduring, you know, this six hour flight that was like the pit and the pendulum, you know, um, we get off the plane and our first um, experience is like, wow, the weather is like gorgeous here. Okay, because like I said, normally we go there during the summer and when we go there during the summer, the weather there is like really hot and really dry. You know, it's a desert. But apparently when you go to Las Vegas in the winter time, it's actually like 60 degrees, 70 degrees. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous weather. Okay, very pleasant. So that was our first whiff of Las Vegas when we got off the plane for this, you know, this funeral trip that we were taking, right? So that was pleasant. And we were both kind of like shocked by that, okay? Like right away the vibe, even though we were there to deal with this horrible situation, the vibe wasn't necessarily bad, okay? But, um, now I guess I can say, let me get a sip of my coffee here. I got a nice hot cup of coffee to sit down and explain myself to you today. So I'm gonna take a sip. Now, okay. One thing I wanna mention really quick, okay, is that, you know, prior to this situation that we were faced with, you know, I've explained to you that I'm like working on new music. So for like the, the prior two weeks to this trip, I was really rolling. I mean, I had like, you know, like a rhythm and everything is going great. And I'm having a lot of success in the studio and my ideas are coming out strong and I'm really into it. Right. And then all of a sudden I'm kind of like yanked out of that, you know, happy, you know, system and success that I'm having and then rolling with my new material, it's new songs. And I'm yanked out of that and I'm thrust into this other situation, okay? So it was kind of like surreal in a way, okay? So we got off the plane, the weather's great. We hook up with her dad, you know, we go to their house out there in the desert, you know? And right away, I mean, the feeling was not negative. I mean, when we saw her father, um, it was not sad, really. It was happy. We were happy to see her dad. And, and of course, my wife and her dad were clinging to each other. I mean, they had just lost this person who was really quite a character, quite a remarkable woman in a lot of ways. Um, I could probably devote a Singularity podcast, like, to her. You know, her life was that interesting. And and both my father-in-law and my mother-in-law had quite a remarkable career together as antique collectors, okay? And my father-in-law is a notable, you know, I guess you could call him like a guru for antique collectors out in Las Vegas. Um, He's good friends with that Mark Hall Patton, the guy from uh, Pawn Stars. Um, they've worked together. Um, he's an author, and my mother-in-law was a co-author. You know, she was part of his machine, and she helped him along, and she was instrumental in their success as a couple. So um, it was kind of... Uh, yeah, I mean, she was kind of an interesting lady, you know, and she was also very, um, like, funny. Like, she had a, a very playful kind of personality. Um, she said funny things. She had a lot of funny quotes and funny responses to things. Like, um, I can give you an example. Like, when my wife was younger and she would say things to her mother like, 
oh, you know, it used to be this way. Why can't it be this way anymore? You know, like, why can't I have that again? And her mother would start singing. Uh, Those were the days, my friend. I thought they'd never end. You know, she had like this funny kind of personality, you know, like, a, I guess, kind of a smart ass, like in a way, but in a very playful and funny way. OK, and where it was really funny, her timing and, you know, what she would come up with. Right. So that's important, I guess, in the story, because, OK, so basically, OK, we hook up with her dad and he kind of establishes with my wife, like right off the bat, that he doesn't really want to get his arms around the whole funeral process thing. He doesn't really want to have it his way. He wants my wife to have it her way. He wants her to be happy with how the situation with her deceased mother is handled. So we're talking about, you know, viewing the body, uh, cremation. Her mother had requested cremation, the sprinkling of her ashes, on a particular location. Um, so like her father was not uh, pushing it off on her as much as he was kind of like giving her freedom to choose a way of handling her deceased mother's remains in a way that would make her happy. OK, which I thought was really kind of sweet in a way like that he was that open to making his daughter happy. Okay. Um, and I gotta say, you know, even though we were there because of this tragedy, I have to say that the spirit of everyone was somehow like mysteriously not sad. I mean, we were sad, we would cry and we would mourn a little, but most of the time the spirit was not down. It was actually up and both my wife and myself and my father-in-law, really, we were all kind of like articulating that to each other. Like, isn't it strange that we're not really, really sad all the time? Like we're actually kind of like sometimes even having fun and laughing about things and laughing about memories and remembering things. And of course, like, you know, her father and mother were antique collectors. So, you know, they had photograph albums and scrapbooks and pictures and just artifacts, things from the past that they had accumulated over the years. So there was a lot of this pouring through the past and it was not with a heavy heart. I mean, sometimes it was, but for the most part, for some weird reason, we all felt kind of happy. Okay. Um, like so much so that we questioned it. Like, is this right that we should be this kind of like happy? We should be sadder than we are. Okay. So, keep that in mind. Okay. The, because it, it stayed with us throughout the duration of this trip and throughout the duration of this process of, you know, handling, dealing with my wife's deceased mother. Okay. So we get all the details about when she died and how she died and she died in her sleep and they had said it was a heart attack in her sleep and my father-in-law expressed, you know, she laid down to take a nap and she didn't, you know, she felt tired. She laid down and she never woke up and he went in and checked on her after a while and realized that she wasn't breathing anymore. So the paramedics came, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, she passed away. They carted her body off. That was it. Okay. So when we arrived, that was the state 
of the situation. Okay. Now, you know, we had to meet with like, you know, funeral people and all that kind of stuff. And my wife and I and my father-in-law, all three of us, we kind of tackled that together and we dealt with everything together. So there were three minds coming together to work the situation out. And um, my wife decided that she wanted to view her mother's body before it was cremated. Okay, so they didn't do any kind of embalming or anything. They just stored my mother-in-law until my wife got there. And let me tell you, okay, now, and this is important, okay, because my wife and I have actually talked about this kind of thing. You know, you kind of have to when you're married. I mean, you gotta like talk to your spouse about what you want when you die, right? In, in case it happens, because you know, no one ever promised me that I was going to be alive tomorrow. So, you know, you got to sometimes think about it. Not all the time, but sometimes, right? And, you know, my wife and I have always kind of felt real funny about the whole embalming thing and just kind of like this normal process. Like, I'm not necessarily keen on that for myself. I wasn't sure what I wanted, but I know what I don't want. My wife knows what she doesn't want. And we don't want to be, you know, embalmed or something and, you know, have people fussing or messing with our bodies after we've died. And, you know, my mother-in-law apparently felt kind of like the same way. Okay. Um, she wanted to be cremated. She didn't want to have a wake. She didn't want to have a funeral. She didn't want to do the show. You know, she just wanted to have dignity in her death and have it be quick and over with, okay? And not a lot of fuss and not a lot of people, just a small thing, just private, intimate family, okay? Um, and they have a lot of friends out there. <laughs> so that was a problem to some degree because there were a lot of people who felt kind of like cheated that they weren't able to, you know, view her one more time and, you know, all the things that come along with a normal funeral. But my mother-in-law did not want that. So what she did want was to be cremated. And my wife wanted to see her one more time. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because, and man, let me tell you, this is something that really just kind of sticks in my craw. Okay. And you don't really think about this and you don't really know about it. You don't have a reason to know about it until you're in it. Okay but maybe I'm talking about it now to remind myself in the future, when I listen to this in the future, like, oh yeah, okay. Uh, basically, okay, when someone dies and you start, you know, incorporating all the people that handle, you know, human death, okay, the, the industry people, okay? Um, let me tell you something, okay? The guys that we dealt with were very pleasant, they were very timely. They delivered when they said they would. Okay, so there's no complaint in that department. Okay, but you pay for it. And let me tell you something. Okay, this just chaps my ass. Okay, they gouge the shit out of people when they die. You know, the surviving members of the family, like, the prices, the expenses of things, they just nickel and dime absolutely every single thing, okay? And, you know, like a huge markup on everything, you know? Like, for example, okay? My wife wanted to view her mother one more time, 125 bucks, bam, just a viewer, just to have a viewing, 15 minutes, that's it, you know, 125 bucks. Now, if you want like a lock of her hair, you know, that's another 150 bucks. And I mean, just like absolutely every single aspect of everything is not only, you know, are you charged for it? But it's like 
quadrupled. Okay, it's criminal what they do. Okay, now, like I said, you have no reason to even think about these things until you're in the situation. Okay, but let me tell you, I will never forget this. It was a lesson in life. Okay, like what happens in the funeral industry is wrong. Okay, what they do is wrong, in my opinion. Okay, there is no reason why, you know, simple things like that should cost so much. I mean, when we looked at the total bill, you know, of this absolutely bare minimum, you know, funeral situation, I mean, it was like my mother in law had specifically said she wanted the least amount. Okay, so we did it that way. We honored her wishes and the bill was still like through the friggin' roof. Okay. And I'll tell you what, it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Like, ah, it's disgusting what people do, like how they take advantage of people who are grieving and suffering like that and just jack the prices up to like whatever they want. And you know what? You got to pay it because they're doing it. You know, there's no one else to do it. That's what they do. So, ah, it was just, ah, just, just bothers me that they, that it, that it's like that, you know? And, you know, of course my father-in-law didn't really care. I mean, he's, you know, he didn't care. Just sign the check, you know, done. But, oh, for my wife and I, we were both looking at each other like, man, this is kind of like BS, you know, what they charge and what they get away with. Come on, you know? I mean, there is, there are no scruples when it comes to, you know, charging people, you know, that are in bereavement. You know, they just, they just are at the mercy <laughs> of this industry that can charge whatever they want. Anyway, okay, so my wife says she wants to see her mother one more time. So the $125, you know, is spent. We're, you know, we're given a time, a scheduled time to go and view my mother-in-law. Okay. Now, I guess in some ways, you know, this part of the story is kind of humorous in the sense that my wife and I, you know, we know that in a couple days we're going to go and we're going to look at the body of her mother, her deceased mother. And, you know, we kind of don't really know what to expect. Okay. Now, and my wife and I had both talked about this very aspect of this situation. Like we weren't sure what to expect. Like, you know, we both had this vision in our minds, I guess, of like, you know, some dude in a lab coat, like sliding some drawer open, you know, and unzipping the bag. And like, we see her, you know, deceased mother with her hair all matted and, you know, you know, frozen. And, you know, you know, we had watched too many X-Files, you know, uh, like we had this image in our mind of what it might be like. So when we arrived at this building where the viewing was going to take place, my wife and I agreed that I would go in first and kind of like suss out the situation a little bit and kind of like go back out to her and kind of tell her what she can expect or like, you know, maybe something like, honey, you don't really want to see her. Okay. You know, or what wound up happening was I went into the room and I saw my mother-in-law, you know, laying there. And, uh, as God is my witness. Okay. Uh, she looked like she was sleeping. I'm not kidding. I mean, it was shocking. Okay. Um, they had her all covered up except for just her face was showing and a little bit of her hair. So she looked like a baby, like in a papoose, you know, 
But she looked like she was sleeping. I mean, uh, the color of her skin, the... I mean, it just was, like, amazing to me. I mean, I was so shocked. So I go out and I grab my wife. I'm like, come on. you Come on in. You know, it's, it's cool. It's safe. Come look. You're not going to be traumatized by anything. Um, and my wife was just shocked as well. We just both stood there in complete shock that we were so off in, like, what we thought we might <laughs> expect. You know, like what we what we might have been, you know, subject to. And uh, and it was, you know what? I got to say this. OK, I've been to like a lot of wakes and funerals in my life. You know, I'm almost 50 years old now. Um, I got to say. Uh, of all the funerals and wakes that I've been to, this was the most pleasant and dignified one I'd ever been to. And and. My wife and I only had, you know, 15 minutes. That's it. They start the clock. And after 15 minutes is up, you know, the workers come in, they ask you to leave and the viewing is over. Okay. But you know what? That was all that we needed. That was all that my wife needed. And I think she and I both were kind of like walking away from the situation in shock that it was as pleasant and as beautiful and as dignified and as simple and meaningful as it was. I mean, it really was. You know, there wasn't any makeup on her. There wasn't any kind of like, you know, lighting and, you know, the the show that they put on it wakes and funerals. You know, there was none of that. It was just simple, dignified, natural. And you know what? It was fine. It was fine. It was okay. So, you know, my wife and I walk away from the situation kind of talking to each other like, you know what? You know, (laughs) that wasn't so bad. You know, like, I think I might want that for me. And she's like, I think I might want that for me too. Like no embalming, none of that stuff. None of the show, just simple, man, simple. I die, put me in a cooler for a couple of days, you know, give my family, you know, my immediate family, you know, 15 minutes to come see me if they want to one, one last time, right? And that's it, man. That's it. That's all you need. You don't need hours and hours and catering and lighting and invitations and all that stuff. You don't need it. It was so much more dignified and beautiful the way that my mother-in-law had chosen to do it. And man, I can't express that enough. Okay. And by the way, my father-in-law had opted to not go with us. Okay. He just, he didn't think he could handle it. Okay. And I guess in some ways I can understand that, but in hindsight, I think he might have actually not, it might not have been as hard as he thought. Okay. But what do I know? Okay. It was his wife, not mine. Okay. But anyway, so. You know, my wife and I are are staying in Las Vegas. You know, we're visitors for this situation. We're visiting and, you know, we have a, you know, somewhat of a time constraint on how much time we have before we have to get back on a plane and get back to our life. Right. And um, so time and the handling of the situation was a factor. Okay. Not everything, but it was a factor. Okay, it wasn't it wasn't the most important thing. Like if we had to stay longer, we would have, we could have, but um, we kind of expressed to the funeral industry people that we were dealing with that you know time was of the essence and that we you know would like to have the situation wrapped up, you know in a timely fashion so that we could get back to our life. And I got to say this particular 
you know, what, company or something or funeral family or whatever that we were dealing with, they did come through for us. Okay. And they handed us a urn full of ashes, you know, in just a matter of a couple days after we viewed her mother for the last time. Now, the whole time my father-in-law was kind of like going back and forth about, you know, being, you know, organized and, you know, disciplined and getting things done and then like, you know, grieving. There's like this swinging back and forth between that. So there was a lot of that. And he had kind of expressed to us, like, he didn't want to see her one last time. He didn't want to go with us to where we scattered the ashes. He wanted us to just handle it in a way that made my wife happy and honored the wishes of my mother-in-law. And he would just kind of stand back and just let us do it. He didn't want to be part of it. It was too much for him. But we were on our way to pick up this urn of ashes from my mother-in-law and my father-in-law just kind of like decided he wanted to go too. Okay. So we all jump in the car. We go to this place. We pick up this urn full of ashes and my wife and I, you know, a couple days prior had gone to a spot that my mother-in-law had talked about where she wanted her ashes scattered. So my wife and I went to this spot, we found it, and we kind of explored it a little bit, kind of like a dry run, you know? So the plan was to go pick up her urn and go right to that spot, you know, just my wife and myself, and we would sprinkle her mother's ashes on this spot, okay? But now my father-in-law is in the car with us, and that wasn't part of the plan. So which is fine. You know, it was kind of like, in a way, it was kind of like surprising, you know, that he was kind of willing to go. Like he wasn't too, you know, worked up. It was like something he thought he could handle and he did handle. Um, but basically what wound up happening was, you know, my wife and my father-in-law, because he's an elderly guy and he has a little bit of a hard time getting around and stuff. So there was like no way he's going to do any mountain climbing. Okay. So the decision was made that since her father was with us, that they would kind of both hang back like at the car where I parked the car and I would take this urn of ashes, me, you know, Mike, uh, you know, would take the urn of ashes and, you know, climb up this mountain. (laughs) Can't believe it. And, you know, I would be the one who would sprinkle her ashes. Okay. Now, I have to remind you, okay, I hate to be like this, but I have to remind you about that, you know, slip and fall that I had, you know, a few days prior where my, you know, my ass is like killing me. Okay. So I had to kind of laugh, you know, as I'm walking away from the car and from my wife and her father who are, you know, kind of like holding hands and, you know, uh, watching from afar and, you know, having whatever conversation they're having while I'm you know, trekking out onto this mountain and, you know, preparing to scatter these ashes. Okay. So I'm, I'm walking away from the car and I'm thinking to myself, well, one, my ass is like killing me. Okay. This is, this is going to be painful climbing a mountain with this situation in my bum. And, you know, I'm also thinking to myself at the same time, like I remembered like when I first met my mother-in-law, like the first time I ever met her, okay? The first time we ever talked and it was so long ago and it was just so long ago. And uh, I even explained this to my wife later and she thought it was kind of funny. I was just kind of like walking up this hill, walking up this mountain really with this urn of ashes saying to myself, Who would have ever guessed the first time I ever met that woman, okay? And of all the people she ever met, and there were like millions, okay? Um, And all the people that loved her and cared about her and knew about her, okay? Who would have ever guessed when I first met her that I was going to be the guy 
who would scatter her ashes when she died. And I was going to marry her daughter, you know, and like I would be climbing a mountain in Las Vegas, Nevada. You know, we lived in Ohio. That's where we grew up. You know, it's where this whole story starts. Um, you know, who would have ever guessed that I would be the guy climbing the mountain with her ashes and I would scatter her ashes, not her husband, not her daughter, not her brothers or anybody like that. Uh, it was just one of those things that kind of like struck me as I'm climbing this mountain. And then it kind of like sunk in with me, like the gravity and the weight of what I'm doing now, what I'm about to do and, and what an honor it was. Um, and, you know, I could see, you know, way off in the distance, my car with my wife and her father. And there I am, you know, on top of this mountain. Now you have to kind of look at it from my perspective. All right. Just a few days prior, I'm sitting in my studio, you know, recording songs. And just a couple days later, you know, a few days later, I'm on top of a mountain in Las Vegas, sprinkling my mother-in-law's ashes, right? And then just a few days after that, I'd be right back in my studio again, making music pretty tripped out. I mean, it's almost like it was a dream and it didn't really happen. I mean, it's like so quick and now it's all done and I'm back in my studio. And I'm like, did this really happen? I mean, it was like so quick, just like a dream, just like a dream. Okay. Or a nightmare, but no, it wasn't a nightmare. It was, it was pleasant. You know, uh, I sprinkled her mother's ashes. I, I followed through with her wishes and, um, everything was carried out to a T exactly what she wanted. Uh, cause I believe in that, you know, in my belief system and my religion. Okay. There's a thing called the corporeal acts of mercy. Okay. And it, uh, is basically a set of protocols and standards, um, on how to handle death and funerals and things like that. And, um, so I take that very seriously. I always have. Um, in fact, I actually worked uh, at a cemetery for a while as like an exercise in the corporeal acts of mercy. I think a lot of my friends were wondering what the hell I was doing, but that's what I was doing. It was a spiritual thing. Um, and I could do a singularity podcast about that later on. I think I probably will because it's important to talk about that. But um, the point is, is that I take this whole situation extremely seriously. I take it very seriously. So I followed through with my mother-in-law's wishes to an absolute detailed T. Everything perfect. Mission completed. Ashes are scattered. Uh, we kind of like go back to my father's place, kind of hang out a little bit, talk. Everything was okay. Everybody was okay. Everybody is okay. And we were kind of like, you know, once again, reiterating that, like, should we be sadder than we are? I mean, it was like for some reason, and this is the conclusion I came to. I think my wife kind of did too. And then ultimately my father-in-law did too, was that it just seemed, okay, that from the moment we got on the plane, from the moment we got off the plane in Massachusetts, when the trip was over, okay, there was a state of grace that we were all in and we can't explain why there wasn't a lot of crying and a lot of mourning and sadness. Maybe it was, some of it was shock or something because that was definitely a factor, but it just seemed like everything fell into place. There was no hassle. Everything went smoothly. Everything was dignified and it wasn't completely sad. We had some positive experiences. We ate a lot of good food and talked a lot and laughed a lot and remembered a lot. And it was just, folks, let me tell you, it was just beautiful. And my wife and I both just kind of were talking amongst ourselves, kind of saying, you know, it does seem awfully weird. It just was really pleasant. You know, it was not what we thought it might be like. It was pleasant. And there was a state of grace 
it had kind of descended on us and everything was okay. Everything was okay. Think about that. Everything was just okay. It was fine. And I thought about it, you know, because, you know, my mother-in-law, let me get a sip of my coffee here. Okay. Um, my mother-in-law, um, in her spare time, when she wasn't working, you know, what they weren't doing their antique thing in Las Vegas, she had devoted a lot of her free time to working with the poor. She worked in a thrift store at her church. Um, you know, it was, you know, social, but um, she had devoted a lot of her time to that situation and helping out people who were less fortunate or whatever. And I just kind of thought to myself, I don't know, maybe it was like a thought voice, you know, speaking to me, saying that, you know, this had been paid forward, that this grace that had descended upon us, particularly my father-in-law and my wife, and me too, uh, the three of us, was a gift and a reward for the life that this woman had lived because she was a great woman. She had a lot of struggles, a lot of difficult things. She did a lot of amazing things. Uh, you know, obviously she remained faithful to her husband for 52 years. She raised a fantastic daughter, you know, one of the greatest people I've ever known or will ever know. Um, and just, you know, this, this, this human being, this woman who lived a great life and she did what she wanted to do and she loved God and she was now at peace and now rest had come. She was resting. She had earned her sleep. You know, she had earned her rest and, uh, you know, we came home a few days later, you know, and everything was over, everything was done. And, you know, we were sad a little bit still. And, but both my wife, myself, and my father-in-law, you know, we all kind of, even up to, you know, right now, this very moment, we would all kind of say the same thing that, for some unknown reason, for some unexplainable reason, everything just came into place. It wasn't so bad. Everything was okay. So that, my friends, is the story of why you haven't got, why you haven't gotten a new Singularity podcast from me over the past couple of weeks. I wasn't shirking my duties. I was going through one of the most, uh, what, surreal, uh, amazing, profound, beautiful experiences, and it came and went, now it's over. It's done. The mission is completed. It's done. My mother-in-law is at rest. And now, you know, on with the grieving process in our own time and in our own hearts and minds. Okay, so now what I'm going to tell you is this. To cap off this Singularity podcast, I have a couple of Singularity podcasts I made for you prior to my going on this trip. But um, I'm going to give them to you. They're coming. I'm going to release them. But they're, they may be a little disjointed, you know, time-wise, chronologically, because obviously, you know, they came before this podcast. So uh, I'll let you figure it out, but you'll understand when you hear it. So with that, uh, thanks for bearing with me. And remember, folks, if you want to keep what you've got, you've got to give it away. Take it easy. <laughs>